Okay. Just give it a few minutes. People are starting to, to filter in. Hello to Spencer's parents. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's right. And let me let me record this for Spencer's mom. This is all about his mom, his mother. <laughs> That's why we're doing this, of course. Hey, mom. Yeah. And can we plug your dad's book? We can plug my dad's book. Yeah. Great uh, book. Yeah. Great book. Larry's right. kidney, baby. You heard it here. Larry's kidney. Larry's kidney. <laughs> <Bye>. <laughs> All right, we're, we're growing here. So just give it a couple, I said, give it two more minutes because the numbers are just, ooh, they are really growing fast. This is great. <laughs> Highly anticipated. I think this is a much needed laughter and contemplation or reflection tonight. All right, I'm gonna start. So I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Kwame Campbell, uh, class of 92 from Brown University. I am also one of the, um, uh, co-chairs of the Career Networking Planning Committee of the Brown Club of New York. The Brown Club of New York is the oldest alumni organization at Brown and also the largest. Um, we pride ourselves on showcasing our amazingly talented Brown alumni whenever and wherever possible. And as such tonight, we are delighted to have a wonderful evening of laughter, reflection and contemplation. And more than that, I'm excited that we are partnering with Hillel at Brown University um, we are partnering with an organization that has done amazing things to, I would say, educate students about Jewish life at Brown, beyond Brown, and more. So I'd like to first introduce um, Rabbi Josh Bolton, and if you can talk a little about the amazing things you're doing with Hillel, and again, we're excited to partner with you guys on this amazing event tonight. Thank you, Josh. Awesome. awesome. Thank you so much, Kwame, and I'm so glad to be with everyone this evening. I'm coming to you live from the uh, corner of Angel and Brown Streets, just uh, a block from the main green here in Providence, uh, Rhode Island. I'm glad to be with everyone. And we're super excited tonight, uh, Brown Risty Hillel, to uh, be partnering with our, our friends, the, uh, the Brown Club in New York. And especially, um, I'm grateful to, to Kwame and to, to Hannah Pasternak, who are the co-chairs of Brown Risty Hillel's Alumni Engagement Committee, for uh, pulling together this uh, awesome event this evening. And actually, if it's not mentioned, I just want to mention that this event was supposed to take place in person about two years ago. And as AJ mentioned, this was maybe one of the first events that 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 you know that we had to cancel when the when when this long uh, journey of this you know pandemic was was really beginning. And so it's a it's um, it's a pleasure to be able to to finally come Come back to hear the voices of AJ and Dana, and it's uh, it's exciting. Even though we can't do this in person, to have woven in Spencer uh, as well along the along the path. So uh, I'm grateful uh, for everyone for being with us tonight. And I just want to say one thing really quickly. You know, um, I think that uh, uh, there's been remarkable, uh, creative, fun, thoughtful energy uh, really emanating from and, and infusing everything that Brown Mersey Hillel has been up to over the past many seasons. And um, emblematic of that, I wanted to just announce, because I'm, I'm proud of this and I think it's exciting and I want everyone in the community to know that actually Brown Rizdi Hillel was, uh, was recently awarded by Hillel International with a, an award, the Philip H. and Susan Rudd Cohen Outstanding Campus Award. This award is given to two campuses each year, uh, kind of the best camp, best Hillels in the world, let's say. So I'm extremely excited that, that I get the chance to announce that to this community. And I think that this event and all of the virtual events and in-person events that we've been hosting are really emblematic of why um, Brown Mersey Hillel really is at the forefront of uh, Jewish life on campus across the country and in the world. And, and um, yeah, I think that I just wanted to, to again, thank everyone for being here with us tonight. Um, Kwame and Hannah, thank you for your hard work in bringing this together. And um, without any further ado, I'm gonna hand it over, I believe, to Spencer, who's gonna uh, kick off the, the evening for us tonight. Great, thank you so much for that introduction, Josh. Um, thanks to Brown Club New York and Brown Hillel for making this happen. Um, I'm really excited to be here uh, with AJ Jacobs and Dana Schwartz, two fantastic writers um, who I've personally been a big fan of for a long time. Um, and we're really excited to be here and having this talk for you guys. Um, I'm going to do a quick couple little bios uh, for the folks we got here. AJ Jacobs is an author, journalist, lecturer, and human guinea pig. He's written four New York Times bestsellers that combine memoir, science, humor, and a dash of self-help. 
He's also editor at large at Esquire Magazine, a commentator on NPR, and a columnist for Mental Floss Magazine. And his upcoming book, The Puzzler, goes on a rollicking journey to understand the enduring power of puzzles, why we love them, what they do to our brains, and how they can improve our world. So, AJ Jacobs. Thank you, Spencer, and thank you, Hillel. Thank you, Brown Club. Thank you, Dana. Very excited, and I'm excited to be with Spencer and Dana, who are so accomplished and so young. It is, uh, it's unbelievable. You know, I don't know how you accomplish so much. Uh, I've been doing this for the 25 years, and you, you're, you're eclipsing me. So. Um, yeah, I'll just do a quick intro to myself. Uh, as Spencer mentioned, I'm a writer and I went to Brown, class of 1990. And uh, I actually, I would say I got my start writing at Brown. I, uh, I was not a good writer, but uh, I am happy that they allowed me to write about interesting topics. I do think I got to explore. I remember I wrote a paper uh, for about the, um, the sexual politics of the Smurf village, which I think was ahead of its time. Like, I think it stands up because there is one, there are 99 male Smurfs. I think they identified as male. It's, it's not 100% clear. But then uh, there was this one female Smurf and that was her entire identity was Smurfette. That was it. Like the others had other things going on. Like, you know, they were brainy Smurf or whatever. She was just female. That was it. So uh, I did another one I was proud of about the, um, the use of umlauts in heavy metal band names, <laughs> which uh, were big back then. That was a long time ago. But uh, yeah, that was like a semiotics paper, the semiotics of umlauts in, in Motorhead and Motley Crue. And that's just the M's, by the way. That's just the M's. Uh, and then finally, I want to boast about my uh, anthropology paper that got an A minus. I mean, I'm still still a little annoyed, but uh, I'm, I'm over it. I'm going, getting over it. Uh, it was, uh, but it was about the anthropology of bong hits, the ritual of bong hits, which I don't even know if college students still do. Like with vapes is like, are there bongs left anymore? I'm going to say, yeah. Them? Yeah. That's, that's nice. All right. So anyway, those were my, uh, my works at Brown. Uh, the, the, the book that's most relevant to tonight is a book I wrote like 10, more than 10 years ago now, uh, called The Year of Living Biblically. Uh, and it was about, because I grew up, as I say in the book, with very little religion. I'm Jewish in the same way the Olive Garden is Italian. That's how I identify. And uh, so to learn about religion and the Bible, I decided to take the Bible as literally as possible and follow every rule and the 10 commandments but also i had a beard like like josh's i don't i think yours is is a little better uh trimmed did he go off because he didn't want to show his beard <laughs> probably <laughs> Just beard, beard. Though. uh but anyway so that's uh that's sort of my connection to uh religion and judaism and uh and it gave me a lot of insights uh, and I don't know if they were good insights, but they were insights. So that's me. Uh, and I want to hear about Dana Schwartz. Yeah, um, we'll definitely get into the year of living biblically in a little bit. Um, really fascinating project um, and really eager to hear your take on it. Um, so we also here, as mentioned, have Dana Schwartz, who is a writer of books, TV shows, Marvel comic books and podcasts. She's the creator and host of the number one charting podcast, Noble Blood from iHeartRadio, which tells stories of royals from history. She's also the host of the iHeart original podcast, Haleywood, and a frequent co-host on the Crooked Media podcast, Hysteria. She's the author of three books, and her fourth, called Anatomy, A Love Story, is due out on January 18th, one month from now, so mark your calendars. Dana Schwartz. Hi, thank you uh, so much for that introduction. Uh, yeah, it sort of feels like hearing it back, like my career is kind of all over the place, but I've been very, very lucky to get to work in comics and TV and back to books where I sort of started. Um, my experience at Brown was a little different uh, than AJ's. First, I just have to say, I'm like genuinely starstruck to be on a panel. AJ, I've been a fan of your writing forever since, since borders were things, because I remember specifically buying your book at a borders 
Oh, uh, which, nice. yeah. Rest in peace. <laughs> May its memory be a blessing. May its memory be a blessing. <laughs> I was pre-med in college for most of my time, and I was just really intimidated by all the very cool and very talented writers who actually were, you know, English lit majors, concentrators. I actually did go to Brown. Uh, and so I just sort of secretly always loved writing in history, but I figured I would never be able to make a living at it. So I took writing classes. Um, I do remember taking a fiction writing workshop and the professor who was a visiting professor uh, told me in my year end review that I would make maybe, I was like, oh, like, do you think maybe, it was like my senior year, I really want to be a writer. I was like, do you think I have a chance? Like, do you think I have it? And he told me that I might become a successful commercial writer, which was the biggest backhanded compliment that he could give. <laughs> Cause he was like an <laughs> experimental prose poet. So that, well, that's you done. Are. You are very uh, yeah, I try my best. Uh, I don't remember a single essay I wrote when I was at Brown, uh, but I did take several classes on European history that I bring, that I use in Noble Blood all the time. Um, and I think like in terms of uh, my Jewish identity, I sang in the uh, Jewish themed acapella group through Hillel called the Olive Beats when I was at Brown. Um, and I feel like being in Hollywood, I'm like, and like being a TV writer in Hollywood is like as close to my Jewish identity as I possibly can be. Like, I feel very in touch with my people here. I'm so glad that you found a, a community. Um, yeah. It, across across uh, the ocean from, or across <laughs> the country from where you went to college. Yeah, exactly. Um, I also do want to point out um, we have a Q&A function open um, and we'll save about 15 minutes at the end for that. Um, so if you're listening, have any questions for these two awesome writers, uh, please put them in the chat and we'll get to those at the end. Um, so I, I want to get started by asking the question that's on everyone's mind, uh, which is that Hanukkah was so early this year. Did you guys get all your presents in time? Yeah. Yeah, I'm a really good present buyer. That's like a thing that I pride myself on. And so I had eight presents lined up for my uh, fiance, Ian, that we opened the first night. First night. Yeah, all eight, because we're adults. And he got you eight as well? Yeah, I think he had more like seven, like a few, he had fewer big ones. I was, I, I had some knickknacks that I threw in. Yeah, you can fudge a little bit. But we both did, I just want to go on the record. We both did really well. End of November, had all the gifts, made homemade latkes. Like I made latkes with potatoes and onions that I did in the food processor. Mm -hmm. Sufganyot, ice cream. I had a real Hanukkah. That is, and I, I did well, but not because of anything I did. It's, we have a tradition where my wife, uh, you know, in October sends me a couple of Amazon links and I click on them and then they're delivered and then she opens them on Hanukkah and pretends to be surprised. So it's, it's very sweet. So my, yeah, my contribution was clicking three times, I'd say. You're a sitcom husband. That's such like, I feel like a, a CBS sitcom would have a husband buying gifts. That the wife did, gives money. did have a, a sitcom about our marriage and it was just terrible, but uh <laughs> <laughs> that was that was year of living biblically right yeah exactly no offense to the, no little offense. they were lovely people who put it on but it just some cbs i blame cbs yeah screwing it up. sure um it's so cool to have both of you on this panel right now because you have something in common which is that you've both been very successful in wringing humor from unlikely sources oh. um you know aj obviously you've written about the bible and uh, your book the know-it-all uh, had you reading the entire Encyclopedia Britannica um, in quite an amusing way. And, and Dana, Noble Blood finds humor in like the murderous histories of these royals. Um, and if I know you, then I assume that anatomy will have jokes set in spooky Gothic mortuaries. Is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah. Some like graveyard spooks. I also wrote um, a humor book called The White Man's Guide to White Male Writers of the Western Canon that I collaborated on with my friend Jason Katzenstein. And uh, yeah, that was also mining humor out of like the white men of the literary canon being terrible people. Um, that leads into my question, which is how you find yourselves picking these subjects that most people wouldn't necessarily think of as funny, 
to be funny about? Well, I was very nervous when I wrote a book on religion because, you know, it is it is a touchy subject. And uh, I was uh, I was very concerned about the response was going to be. I did take heart in the uh, the theologian Paul Schaefer, the, the band leader for the old David Letterman show, who said that if God is the ultimate being, he has the ultimate sense of humor. So I was like, all right, so maybe I can do this. Uh, but uh, I will say it was not as controversial as I thought it would be. It was weird. It was actually a, it was a very interesting uh, ex example of the, um, uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for? It, uh, people seeing what they want to see. The um, uh, because I got hundreds of emails from uh, from atheists saying, you know, thank you for showing how crazy the Bible is. But I got just as many emails from religious people saying, thank you for renewing my faith in <laughs> in religion. So I'm like, I don't know what I I did, uh, but uh, I, I you know. That I thought is the um, is a very human thing. We want to see what we want to see. Motivated reasoning. That's what I uh, I was looking for. Mm -hmm. I would say I sort of felt early on in my career like I didn't have a specific niche or direction. Like I think some people knew me from Twitter and so expected my writing to be kind of funny. And then I wrote this like open political letter to Jared Kushner that like sort of be, got me like news coverage. And so then people expected that I was a political commentator and I was sort of in this weird place of like, should I be chasing the things that I think are gonna make me popular? Like, and I don't necessarily know how to do those things and I need a personal brand and I'm gonna be, you know, I'm never gonna be make a living as a writer unless I figure out what that brand is very quickly and pivot. And so, I sort of had a, not a breakdown, but like I had a, a real like come to myself moment where I thought like, okay, well, all I can do is things that I genuinely like writing. And I'm like, I genuinely love learning about like European monarchs. And even though nothing about my like mid middling to lesser internet fame had been about historical royals up until that point, I was like, well, I, I'll do it the best I can. And then I just wanted to infuse it with like something that makes me me, which is like a little bit of voiciness. So I think it's like rather than a conscious decision of like, okay, how can I find humor in this? I'm just like, okay, how can I apply my voice to the things that I'm genuinely interested in? And then hopefully like a little bit of humor comes through because that's who I am, hopefully. And so it's been this, this complicated question of trying to find consistencies in my voice across different medium. And I, I think I always come back to humor. Mm. Do you ever so find yourself? Oh, go ahead. Oh, Adrian. sorry. Can I have one follow up? Uh, what was Jared Kushner's reaction? Did you, did you talk to him after? Never, never. Did he's a, he's a, him? he's a bad person. I'll say, um, no, <laughs> no official take. response ever. No one <laughs> ever, they like couldn't fire me because it was like too public, but they just no response. He issued then like a public thing a few days later, but I never heard from him. Interesting. And by the way, uh, I just want to uh, acknowledge Jeffrey Cantor, who is in the audience and who voiced, he played me in the audio version of my first book, The Know-It-All. Oh. Wow. And he was much better than I am uh, at sounding like me. And he, uh, but he just put in the chat the, the phrase I was looking for, which was uh, confirmation bias. That's exactly what uh, it was. It wasn't motivated reasoning. But they he still like, knows your voice, I guess. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Better than me. Uh, so do you guys ever find yourselves writing something or, or tackling a new topic and you're realizing it's, you're not able to write it with the same ease as you've written other stuff? And maybe that's a question of not being able to include your voice or your humor or anything. How do you sort of know when something isn't the right fit for you? I can dive into this one. Um, cool. I've been in a few TV writers rooms and part of being in a TV room is you're not, one, you're not writing for yourself because you're writing for characters, but then you're not even writing what you think these characters are doing. You're writing to serve a showrunner and their voice and you want your voice to match that showrunner's voice as much as possible. And so the thing that I do 
is just take that as its own challenge. Like I check my ego at the door and be like, my job isn't to show off how funny I am, Dana Schwartz. Like they hired me. My job is to make them sound good. And so that becomes my task. Mm. And for me, I would say, I spend two to three years on these books, so I better really like the topic. So I choose very broad topics. And uh, and I, I have gotten a lot of suggestions from readers. Uh, one that keeps recurring is people suggest that I should try to be the greatest lover in the world and do all the positions in the Kama Sutra. And I actually did bring it up to my wife and she's like, absolutely not, and, which is good. First of all, no, I don't want to read that book. I don't want to research that book, you know, no, I love my wife, but that's exhausting. You know, I'm not, I'm too old for that. So uh, it has to be something that A, I'm passionate about, something that is so broad that I can explore it from a hundred different angles. So that's why I, I did. I have an idea. I think you should become a TikTok influencer. <laughs> <laughs> try to get my year of going viral yeah. yeah my year of going viral try to become famous on instagram or tiktok i love that idea that is a good one just give me an acknowledgement and then give me 10 percent of all your spawn con <laughs> absolutely uh, um, all right i'll start practicing my dance move <laughs> my son told me that's no longer a thing on tiktok the dance is, is old but oh no that was very six months ago probably yeah exactly um so we're living right now in a very, I don't know, fraught time, if you will, um, one that's been hard for a lot of people. Um, and I, coming at it sort of from a humorous perspective, have you been able to find that having the ability to sort of reframe the world around you in a humorous light has impacted your life, your mental health during the pandemic? How do you, do you feel like you're able to draw on those skills at all? Dana? I can jump in if you want. I, yeah. I mean, I had, I have a long relationship with germophobia and OCD, and um, I was so I was I've written about it for most of my career. You know how I, uh, I, I, I was in the elbow tapping way. You know many <laughs> years ago, and I actually like three years, I actually went to therapy and did all this CBT to try to get over my neuroses. Because I didn't think, I thought it was A, it wasn't good for my mental health. B, I also stopped writing about it a little because I didn't want to reinforce the neurotic Jew OCD stereotype, which, which is fun. I, you know, it's good, but I felt that it played itself out. And also Donald Trump at the time was known as a germaphobe. And I'm like, well, that doesn't speak well to germaphobes. So I'm gonna to try to get over this. So uh, I got over, I like did pretty well. And then like six months later, COVID hits and I'm like, oh, so I'm right back in it. But I was a little bit, I was able to have a little bit of a more rational OCD where I didn't, I didn't hate the germs like and obsess over them. I just tried to do the best practices, uh, but yeah. Uh, uh, and I have written about that and, and I tried to write about it in a humorous way because yeah, obviously that is, it's a great way to deal with tragedy. It's a very Jewish way to deal, deal with tragedy. And I actually, I knew Spencer, you were going to do this. So I did, cause I had remembered, I once, um, had lunch with a rabbi who had written a book about humor in the Holocaust, which is like, you know, not jokes about the Holocaust, but like jokes made by Jewish people during the Holocaust. And, uh, and I actually, I'm gonna, I'm, I'll, I'll tell you the joke he told me. I don't have it word for word because I tried to do some Googling and it was just, wow, you don't wanna Google that topic. But, uh, but the joke was, and then I'll, uh, I'll stop talking, but, it's something along the lines of this man is in a camp and he receives a note from his wife. And the wife says that there is a, a treasure of gold coins that's buried on our farm. And she says, don't worry about the gold coins. They're still there. And the man gets the letter and he's like, why? Why did she say that? We don't have any buried treasure. Uh, the next month, he gets another letter from his wife and it says, well, 
we were worried, if you were worried that we wouldn't have farm hands to till the soil, you don't have to worry because a whole bunch of Nazi soldiers came and tilled the soil for us. And the joke being, of course, you know, she outwitted the Nazis and made them till her soil at the farm. And I love that. So I don't think there is any topic that is off limits. It's all about how you approach it. It's all about punching up instead of punching down and, uh, and things like that. Can you just explain that phrase for those who might not be familiar with that? Sure. I think I got it from like your generation. I don't, we didn't talk like that is, uh, you know, when, when you are, uh, using humor, you should use it to, uh, attack the powerful corrupt people as opposed to the disadvantaged. Mm -hmm. It's funny that you bring up, um, humor in the Holocaust, because I, I read Man's Search for Meaning this past summer. Um, it's got a joke in it. It's got a good joke. Um, I, I will briefly tell it right now, but um, they used to, uh, when they were being served soup, uh, they would hope that they would get uh, scoops from the bottom where there were bits of potato and cabbage and it was more hearty. Um, and Viktor Frankl and one of, one of the friends he had made there were joking at the time about how years after this is over and we're in some fancy restaurant the waiter comes by bringing us soup we'll say oh would you mind getting some from the bottom for us <laughs> and i was like that's amazing that he's able to have that sort of attitude um and it which takes me into my next topic which is judaism and humor and and the way that i feel that jews are widely regarded as the progenitors of dark humor in a certain way um I feel like our people have gone through so much hardship that it's entirely possible we wouldn't have even survived without being able to crack a couple of jokes and view our situation from a different angle, you know, if only for a minute. So how do you think that being Jewish has impacted your sense of humor? Dana, we can start with you here. I feel like it just like it made me very proud of certain influences. Like I feel like I growing up, like I took a lot of pride in like Mel Brooks movies and like having a Jewish sense of humor made me feel like I was like part of an exclusive club of like cool New Yorkers that my like local Midwesterner could only be friends with in my fantasies. Like, you know, I'd be reading like Fran Leibowitz or watching, well, no longer, but you know, used to be watching Woody Allen movies. <laughs> uh, and yeah, I, I think it, it just really informed, like, I think I, I grew up imitating a certain Borscht Belt style of Jewish humor. And it made me like really proud to be Jewish. And then it, I was imitating that until it became my actual sense of humor, like the Steinfeld, Larry David sense of humor that I, I think that sort of encapsulates it. Okay. I love that. Yeah. And I think, you know, it was what I grew up on. It was like just what I absorbed. And, uh, I, you know, even without consciously trying, that is. And I think, you know, the, uh, this is not, I'm not the first to say this, but having an outsider's point of view, even though I grew up in New York City <laughs> among a lot of Jews, there is still a sense of being an outsider uh, just, you know, from watching national media. So I, I do, and I do think if you look at comedy, you know, it's, it's usually the outsiders, whether it's black people or Jewish people, you know, those are, those are where, not to say like, you know, Bob Newhart, very funny. I think he's Protestant, but, uh, but a, lot, a lot of times being an outsider uh, helps with your sense of humor. Mm. Well, yeah, I mean, Jews are a minority, but I feel like we're oftentimes afforded privileges that other minorities are not, which sort of makes for a really interesting dynamic when it comes to punching up and punching down. Um, how do you guys approach this dynamic when it comes to your writing? I do try to punch up in that I I think being on the internet for so long has made me it's not sensitive but at least aware of any you don't I don't need to joke about everything just because you can doesn't mean you necessarily should and I feel like there's an impulse sometimes on Twitter and the internet where it's like whatever the news story is of the day it's like a rush to uh figure out your take that's so funny and clever and like get it out and I think like Recently, I have taken to pausing and being like, is this something that I, Dana Schwartz, need to make like a funny quip about for everyone to hear? Like, is it an issue that directly affects me? Or is it something that I can just like 
say to the my friends, the people around me. So I think like that's not like a good answer necessarily, but that is just sort of how I've approached issues. I think like there is a high, a low cost, high risk to making jokes on the internet if you're not a professional comedian. And so I don't a lot of the time. And I try to make jokes about things that are like in my wheelhouse or about my work or just making fun of like actual assholes, like, like political, like monsters. <laughs> mm-hmm. I love that. Well, Dana, I love, and I want to, I want to second that. Cause I think that my, uh, my new year's resolution is to have uh, fewer opinions because uh, my, my year of having no opinions, yeah. yes, no opinions. I, you know, it's okay to have a few, but they got to have quality, not quantity. Cause you know, you don't have to have, you don't have to have an opinion on everything. I mean, I think that we need to like, start saying things like, you know, hmm, let me think about that. Let me research it and get more data. Yeah. Let me pause. And, and that, uh, which I think is actually kind of goes against our culture. Like we are, the stereotype is that we are a very opinionated people and uh, <laughs> we love to argue, which is good. I think there is, again, uh, I'm not... Uh, I'm not expressing an opinion on uh, whether Jews should have opinion, but I guess I'm saying it's good to have a balance. Like don't, um, one of the themes of my new book, my new book uh, that's coming out, it's not out yet, but it's all about puzzles and sort of the, uh, oh, look at that. Uh, you want it to be in the, in the Zoom. Sure. The, um, and the sort of the catchphrase I have in there is, is uh, don't be, uh, don't be furious be curious uh which i, I love that from like yeah i didn't make it up it was like a, a child psychologist i saw in this webinar on like how not to go crazy during covid but i'm like you know it's not just child. you know it could be for anyone just yeah let's try to tamp down the anger a little which is useful in some cases but uh and ramp up the curiosity mm. um i was speaking with dana last week about um her take on Sarah Silverman's recent comments about Jew face, oh. uh, which I thought was interesting. Um, sort of the recent phenomenon, not even recent, but a phenomenon we've been seeing of um, non-Jews playing characters who are very kind of quintessentially Jewish and, and kind of adopting these Jewish uh, affect in their performances. You know, you have Rachel Brosnahan in Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, um, you know, Felicity Jones playing Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and, and people have some interesting opinions on this. And I was wondering um, how you guys feel about uh, the going in playing Jews. Yeah, I feel like I brought this up specifically because I don't know. I don't have a strong opinion on this. This is something where I'm like, oh, it's like an interesting observation that like Catherine Hahn is like always a Jew mm-hmm. for some reason or yeah. like always coded as Jewish. She's not a Jew. That's no, a not but a then Jew. again, but then again, <laughs> exactly. we have we have some really great Jews who people don't know where it's like Scarlett Johansson and the Halls and like Daniel Radcliffe. Like we have some great stealth really? Jews out there. So on one stealth hand, Jews. I'm like, it's kind of weird that like some of the most prominent Jewish roles go to non-Jews when like, I think some of our most famous Jews get non-Jewish roles. Um, and I think it should, like, I think Jewish actors shouldn't only have to play Jewish parts because they're like, there's like two that come out a year about like, this is a Jewish part. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it's like an interesting observation. It's like, oh, they tend to go with like people with brown hair, but blue eyes or like smaller noses. But I think that that tends to be more about like Western beauty standards than it is about like, Hollywood being anti-Semitic. So I think it's an interesting question and an interesting observation, but I'm not like up in arms about it. And I too will take my uh, my New Year's resolution and not have a strong opinion about this. <laughs> I haven't thought about it very much. I know that Jeffrey Kanner is a great, the one who did my uh, audiobook. he's a great actor and he, uh, he often plays, he played uh, Seth Rogen's dad in uh, pickle is pickled i think it was called so ah. he he i'm sure has some interesting thoughts but i will say i can see both sides you know i can see if you take the only x should play x to its extreme like only i could play myself like you can't you know like uh i remember when uh, the um 
Freddie Mercury movie came out, you know, he was Zoroastrian, which is not a very, like that's smaller than Judaism, I think. Uh, and uh, the guy who played him, not a Zoroastrian, but you didn't see a lot of uh, complaints. So um, I can see that side, but then I can also see the side that, uh, you know, if, if every other culture is playing, uh, you know, get, gets cast as their culture, why should, why should Jews be any different? So uh, I'm going to have to think about it. That's my, uh, I'm going to go back and give it some thought. Great. Um, I also want to talk about um, a, a very famous funny Jew that was one of my influences um, growing up, which was uh, Jonathan Leibowitz. You might know him as John Stewart, um, but he recently like, was in- AJ what? Jacobs knows him personally because he's, he blurbed your book. He I, do book? Know him. I do know Jonathan, John Stewart. I love him. I'm, and I'll just tell you quickly, my, uh, my, my uh, interaction with him, because I was working at Esquire magazine and he had just taken over the Daily Show and we put him on the cover, uh, which, you know, he wasn't quite famous enough to be on the cover at that point, but we loved him. And, uh, and the conceit for the article was that I would write a very almost cliched celebrity article about, you know, what he'd done and what he was eating while we were talking. And, and then I would give him the article and he would annotate it and make fun of me. And first of all, two things about it. One, he was so fast. I went to his house. He lived in the village at the time and he was so fast. I gave him the article and 10 minutes later, he had like 25 hilarious jokes making fun of me. I was like, how did you even, I couldn't even read it that fast. And then the jokes, of course, you know, were great. And and the, I do remember one that was was Jew related. There, I think there were several that were Jewish. But one was uh, when I interviewed him, he actually he happened to be eating a chocolate babka. So I mentioned, like, you know, said John as he ate his chocolate babka. And then he wrote in the margin, he wrote, uh, Jewy Jew, Jews, a chocolate Jew. Like, so just basically saying, I was uh, stereotyping him as too Jewish, or he was acting too Jewish, something like that. But it, uh, he was remarkable, and um, yeah, I'm a big fan. I I haven't talked to him in like you know, 15 years, but uh, I think he is uh, he's an he's an amazing mind. Yeah. Well, he's. You had. Well. I, I interrupted your question, so you have some. You were going. No, somewhere. I'm really glad we heard that. That was really cool. Um, He's doing pretty well right now. He's got his new show out um, on Apple TV. Um, and it's actually interesting because people are saying it sort of shies away from, you know, the kind of sort of snarky kind of joke a minute attitude of The Daily Show and just sort of more in-depth, earnest activism. And I was wondering what you guys make of this switch and how you see it sort of reflecting the shifting world around it and our attitudes towards comedy and politics from when The Daily Show started back in the early 2000s until now. You know, as someone who did transition, like Nova Blood isn't as funny as like maybe what people would have expected from me on Twitter. Like I think everyone should be entitled and allowed like to grow and be taken seriously or do whatever they want. Like I really do respect uh, John Stewart coming back and being like, no, this is the show I want. It's not going to be the exact same as The Daily Show because it's where my interests lie now. I think after Trump, people have like made this point much more eloquently than I'm about to, but like he took a lot of the humor out of politics because it seemed less harmless. Like trolling felt more dangerous. And when when politics was sort of this immutable boring thing where it was like yeah republicans are guys in suits and democrats are guys in suits and they're basically saying the same thing like oh those jokers on capitol hill like it seemed like sort of this unchanging stable thing and when it sort of became destabilized it became less funny to poke fun at it i think and so that maybe is where he's coming from where it's like you don't just want to like rib at something that feels actually shaky and dangerous uh, at least that's been my experience. Like I have found personally, it's like, I don't make cute little ribs about, you know, the insurrection just because I don't have an interest in that. So I really do respect John, uh, John Stewart for doing that. And I also think it's very easy to feel trapped in the like 
late night bubble. Like my fiance is a writer for James Corden and he loves the job, but I do think it becomes very tiring looking at everything through the scope of like, what is the punchy YouTube ready joke of this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, and I agree. I, I support whatever, uh, whatever evolution they take. So I will say that I, uh, I often think when I read this criticism, it's interesting because I interviewed him even before the Esquire article, I interviewed him for an entertainment weekly article. And I think it was, he had like the John Stewart show on MTV or something. Another thing we have in common, AJ Jacobs. I was also a writer for EW. Oh, that's right. Exactly. Sorry, I interrupted, but I love these that's, connections. That's fun. We could talk EW. But, uh, but I do remember uh, one of the things he complained about in, you know, in a humorous way. He's like, what's up with all these old comedians who decide to do something serious? It's like, and his state is like, I'm really good at this thing. Okay, let me do this thing that I suck at. And, uh, and I always thought of that. And then, you know, he, <laughs> I don't think he sucks at it. I think he's very good at what he does. But it is interesting to see, you know, he was like your age when he said that probably. So you are much more mature than he, than he was uh, in seeing that people should be allowed to evolve. No, I privately will, will hate on everyone. I just <laughs> reserve my snark for when cameras aren't rolling. Smart. Um, I want to ask about your upcoming projects too, before we get into the Q and A's. Um, AJ, your new book, The Puzzler, purports to solve or to attempt to solve, among many other puzzles, the meaning of life. How did that go for you? Oh, I got it. I can, no spoiler. I can't tell you, but yeah, I got it. Um, but it's actually a lot about um, my love of puzzles. And uh, I was telling you before the show, um, it's not just jigsaw puzzles. It's my true love is word puzzles, crossword puzzles, but there is a chapter on jigsaw puzzles. And as I mentioned, um, my wife and sons and I, before COVID, right before COVID, we went to Spain and represented the United States of America in the World Jigsaw Puzzle Championship. And uh, we embarrassed our country. We came in second to last. We sucked, but uh, it was fantastic. Because as Dana was saying, it's just so fun to see people so passionate, whatever that passion is, to see them at their peak of their ability. So like, you know, the Russian team, which is very controversial, like there were rumors of doping and stuff like that. <laughs> There's no, no evidence. They seem very nice, but they like, kicked ass they were you had eight hours to complete four huge puzzles and they did it in like three and a half they finished all four my family we literally finished one puzzle after six hours and we're starting on the other when it ended so um anyway that's part of it but you know how much how much is life like a puzzle how much uh can we use puzzle like thinking um one metaphor that someone told me which i like is i think there are life is kind of like a jigsaw puzzle but the puzzle pieces are always changing shape so it's a it's a tough it's a tough puzzle but are you, uh, aj are you good at the spelling bee the new york times spelling bee i do i don't get queen bee very often but i I usually get to genius and it make, I can't start my day unless I'm called a genius by the, the app. What about you? Are you, uh, you're I haven't got, that's, it's sort of like a new thing. Like I just discovered it. Not that I'm the, clearly not a genius. I'm just trying to get into it and I'm not great at it, but I feel like I'll get better. Oh yeah. I, I feel you are, uh, you are spelling the material. Uh, yeah, I'm a big fan. I have a chapter on anagrams and the spelling bee is the big part of it. I'm Very good at chapter. Scrabble. No, very good. Yeah. Well, so I feel like uh, maybe that skill set will. Very transferable. Yeah. Um, we have a, a question from the audience, just real quick Wait, on this topic. Hear... Oh. No, okay. I, I just want to ask uh, what the grand prize was of the World Championship of Puzzles. 4,000 euros and a trophy in the shape of a jigsaw puzzle. So that's, I can't tell if that's better or worse than I was expecting. It's, pretty, <laughs> it's not bad. Yeah, well, these Russians, I asked them, I, uh, you know, are you going to spend it on like, you know, a drug fuel binge? And they're like, no, we got to save up because there's another, uh, they got to spend money to, uh, to get to the tournaments. So th they need a sponsor. Anyone out there, if like Nike executives are there, or I guess, I don't know what hand, what hand, hand, I guess Nike, they probably make wristbands or something. Yeah, so to prevent the sweat from dripping. Yeah, like, um, 
arthritis uh, gloves. <laughs> oh yeah, very good. Like yeah. carpal tunnel uh, mm -hmm. things. Yeah, there's a big opportunity. Um, Dana, you were pre-med uh, for a long time in undergrad. Mm -hmm. And did that lead at all to your decision to set your new novel in the Victorian medical world? Yeah, I mean, I genuinely like, I'm just fascinated by the human body. Like, I think I would have made a bad doctor because I am a very impatient person. And I've been told by people who love me that I don't, men really have good bedside manner. Um, but I do love the human body. And like, I read about it constantly and I love the history of medicine. Um, and I like gross things. Like I like anatomy and anatomy museums. And so it, it sort of like what AJ was saying before, it's like when you're writing a book, you're like, I'm gonna have to spend like two, three years in this world. And I had traveled to Edinburgh a few times and like loved it and loved the history of surgery that happened there. And I just, yeah, was like weirdly um, uh, compelled by the idea of the dawn of surgery back before uh, anesthesia, back when it was a very like slapdash butcher art type of thing. Uh, so that's, that's why I loved it. it. There's no organic chemistry in this book. Uh, it feels like it would be way easier to be a doctor back then before they understood chemistry. You just have to know the shapes of the things in the body. And yeah, just hack away that. until something happens, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, AJ, you have a mantra that's related to this, right? I do. I do. I, because I read about the, a little of this when I read the encyclopedia for my first book and and I often, one of my themes in that book and in life is that uh, in the good old days were not good. The good old days sucked. They were dangerous, violent, sexist, homophobic, smelly. They just sucked. And, um, you know, we have a lot of challenges today, but we shouldn't have this misplaced nostalgia for some past that didn't exist. So, which, you know, noble blood is a perfect example of this. Like, you know, that. <laughs> It's oh, a, yeah. People dying right and left. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, my three word mantra I got out of that is uh, surgery without anesthesia. Whenever I'm feeling frustrated that my Wi-Fi is out, I just say, you know what? I am, you know what? I, I will never have to undergo surgery without anesthesia. You know what I recently learned about in unrelated reading for noble blood purposes, but something that is unrelated to noble blood? There was a guy in the mid 1800s named Ignaz Semmelweis who figured out that women were dying because of infection. And he's like, hey, maybe doctors should wash their hands uh, before they do childbirth. And all the other doctors like literally laughed and mocked him so much that he had a nervous breakdown and died in an insane asylum. And then a really? few years later, germ theory came out. Ah, uh, I think I mentioned Semmelweis in my, but I didn't know he died in an insane asylum. <laughs> what a hero. Yeah, of infection. Lister, he, Lister he died of an Lister. infection. He oh, died. No. Of infection. Who did? Semmelweis. Semmelweis. They the oh. guards like beat him because they're like, look at this dweeb who believes doctors would wash their hands. So they didn't wash their hands before beating him. No. <laughs> what happened? Isn't that awful? That is <laughs> sad and ironic, and uh, yeah, it should be a movie. Semmelweis, what a hero! What yeah. a hero! I will tell you, I also when I was researching the the. Uh, year of living biblically, I learned that uh, here's another reason not to take the Bible too literally, because when anesthesia first came out, there were people who argued, um, Christians who argue, argued that the Bible says women should be um, have pain in childbirth. So I guess it wasn't anesthesia, it was more like pain blocking epidurals uh, yeah epidurals and that so it would be unbiblical for women to receive epidurals because they should suffer uh that's what we God did wants. eat that apple that one time <laughs> i agree with that no they're right by yourself no one to blame um i want to get to a few audience questions while we still have a few minutes um if you guys were to set a book in providence or at brown what would it be about <laughs> oh i know um uh no aj go come back oh to me. no i want to hear i have no nothing. i'm i'm all right well i do remember like that um you know the mafia i don't know how it is now but when i went there it was still pretty strong i remember i rented we rented a um an apartment from a guy who had a um he had a typewriter repair store and but he drove around literally a gold Mercedes and uh, 
So we were always suspicious of what was going on there. And he had like, you know, he talked about his friends who could take care of business. So I guess it would have, wait, what? There was a movie with the uh, Providence Mafia. Was it to paint? I paint rooms. I paint houses. I paint walls. I heard so, you paint the, uh, the Irishman. Is that what you're I talking about? I heard you about? paint houses. Yeah. Yeah. All right. There you go. Okay. I, I would. I thought of it. I would write the story with H.P. Lovecraft as the anti-Semitic villain <laughs> about people having to face off against him. It's a supernatural thriller about brown students who are trapped in the. 1800 i don't know when hp lovecraft was alive so now i'm embarrassing myself 1800s i think and he was anti right. i don't oh god that. really and he was Everything. a huge anti-semite yeah. so it's like a bunch of kids from the hell i'll go back in time and have to defeat him and his monsters <laughs> nice. Dana, that's so much fun <laughs> can we do, do you want to write it with me <laughs> yeah let's do we that we can write it we can write like a middle grade fiction oh perfect yeah um that's exactly my vibe um Great. Uh, another question is, um, AJ, what was the hardest rule to follow in the Bible for you? Well, there were two types of hard rules. There was the hard rule, like no lying, no coveting, no gossiping. Uh, it was you know, hard for you not to covet? It was very hard for me not to covet. I think I'm a coveter. I mean, it depends how you define coveting, but I think, yeah, we all, we all covet. Uh, and never coveted a day in my life. You never coveted? No, I never covet. I'm not a coveter. I'm not a coveter, Jerry. <laughs> well, there is covet, like there's de degrees of there's the sexual coveting, but then you could just covet a nice, you know, latte at Starbucks or something. So you never I covet. make latte money. I can buy a latte for myself. <laughs> okay, good. I'm proud of you. Uh, <laughs> for me, it was very hard. And then, um, but then the, the other type were, of course, the types that don't go over so well in modern day. Uh, uh, America, like, you know, stoning adulterers. And I did, uh, I was able to stone one adulterer using like pebbles. That's how. How I did you it. find the adulterer? I'm so sorry that I am with uh, revealing that I didn't read the book. <laughs> That's quite okay. It was, uh, well, he revealed himself uh, because I was really getting into character. So I had the robe and the beard and the cane. And I was in Central Park and this guy came up to me and said, why are you dressed like that? And I said, I'm trying to follow all the rules of the Bible from the 10 commandments to stoning adulterers. And he says, well, I'm an adulterer. You're going to stone me. And I was like, that would be great. That awesome. Is great. <laughs> and I took out, cause I had been carrying around pebbles for weeks, hoping to run into an adulterer. And there he was. So I, i showed it to him and uh, he grabbed them out of my hands and threw them at me. So I figured uh, an eye for an eye was also a rule in the Bible. So I threw one back at him. And that is how I checked it off the list. That's fantastic. It. Nice work. <laughs> Thank you. Um, how did your families uh, growing up respond to your humor? Were you the, were you the funny child? What, how did that work? No, I, I have a lot of siblings. I have uh, three siblings and I feel like they're still surprised that I sort of am like a public person and that I was like known for being funny. Like one time I was written up in like a fashion magazine, not about fashion, but like my family was making fun of me because I'm like the least fashionable person they know. I would say my little sister, I think is the funniest, but my parents would probably say my brother is the funniest. Um, so I did not grow up as the funny one, but it was a family that rewarded being loud and having opinions and being combative, which you probably can see in my personality like good-natured, combative, challenging. Interesting. Uh, yeah, and my, my dad is actually, he is a very uh, quirky sense of humor. Um, I, I wrote about it in my new book, and he didn't, what I say is he didn't tell dad jokes, he told Dada jokes, because they were so nonsensical and absurdist. That's a that, great bet. That's a great line. Thanks. Uh, to dad jokes. I wonder if the dad that in itself is probably a dad joke saying uh, that, uh, he's a dad joke. So it's recursive. But I, uh, I, he, you know, he would say, he would say things. You know, tell he, his favorite thing was just to confuse strangers. So he would meet someone and start talking about how everyone in the family, him, his wife, me, my sister, were born on February 29th. And, you know, he would tell the odds of that happening and how they arranged it specifically. They like conceived me. So I would be born on. 
And there's no truth to it at all. There was, we, none of us were born on February 29th, but he would just spin these absurdist tales. So anyway, uh, I have a more traditional sense of humor, I think, but maybe his is more creative. Um, what courses do you guys wish that you had taken when you were at Brown? I wish I took more writing classes, just in general, to be better at my craft, because it's what I do for a living. And I wish I, I mean, I work hard at it because I, I try my best, but I wish I had a more formal education in it. And then I wish I took more literature classes and did all the reading. <laughs> so you took classes, just didn't do the reading. I took like one or two classes. And by that point, I was like, I got not to humble brag, but like my, I got, I sold my first book when I was a senior. And so like by the second semester of my senior year, like I was really working hard on that. And I sort of like schoolwork was sort of like by the wayside. Cause I was like, I have a real thing to write. Uh, <laughs> but then that was when I decided I was going to be a writer. So that was when I took, you know, literature classes. And that was the semester that I was focused the least. And which book was that one? It's called, and we're off. It's a YA novel and it's, um, I think you can kind of tell that I'm 20, 22, 23 when I wrote it. I'm proud of it. Like a mother is proud of all their baby ducklings, but I'm, <laughs> I think that my new book is a more mature effort. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is remarkable. You are in the, um, uh, another friend of mine, Kevin Roos, uh, who was, um, who is a fantastic writer, a columnist for the New York Times now. And he was, my intern during the year of living biblically and he was a brown junior or yeah he was a junior at the time so he was a summer intern and then he went off and uh, as as part of that book I took him to Jerry Falwell's church uh, as like a little research I was going there for research for the book and I took him as like you know a thank you for being my intern and doing free labor and he um he was like, what if I transferred from Brown, the most liberal college, to um, Liberty, which is Jerry Falwell's crazy conservative college where, you know, you can't hold a, uh, someone's hand of the opposite sex, much less the same sex. Like, I'm, that would be even worse, but, um, or gender, I should say. And, uh, but anyway, uh, I was like, that is an interesting idea. And uh, so he wrote up a proposal and and he got a book deal and he wrote it and it's a wonderful book. And he was like, yeah, he was a senior at Brown when he wrote that. So you have, uh, you have good company. Have you ever met I mean, Kevin? Good for him. That is a, a horror story if ever I heard one. <laughs> well, the book is very nice because it's, you know, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't shoot fish in the barrel. Like it would be, he, he tries to understand like, you know, are there, is there anything good in this life? And, you know, he was able to find a couple of things. It is still overall, their worldview is very harmful, I think, but, uh, but he, he didn't, you know, I, someone said like, you know, making fun of evangelical Christians is like shooting cows with a machine gun. It's just too easy. So, uh, so yeah, I was proud of him. He did he punched, uh, he didn't punch down. He definitely punched sideways and up. Um, have you guys been back to Brown lately? No, I wanted to go, but there's been a pandemic. <laughs> I guess that'll do it, right? Let me come back. Invite me to in-person events. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. I have my five year coming up. So I'm like, oh, that's a thing I, I gotta be doing year. now. Ugh. That's too bad. I, I took my kids to when they were much younger, like when they were five years old to one of my reunions. And afterwards, one of my kids said that he was not going to go to Brown. He did not going to apply because they had too many porta potties. Like you had to go to bathroom in a porta potty. And I was like, listen, you don't, that's just for like campus dance. You know, I, I rarely went to the bathroom in a porta potty. Like they have actual bathrooms in, in the dorms and apartments. But he was unconvinced. So uh, we'll see. If you <laughs> um, we're a little bit over time. So I just want to, um, yeah, that, that wraps it up pretty much. Um, just want to say thank you to AJ and to Dana for this. Um, it's been a real pleasure talking to you. Um, I had a great time. I hope that everyone uh, at home did as well. 
Um, and thanks again to the Brown Club and to Brown Hillel uh, for putting this on. I know um, also just a quick thing, like a lot of people were asking questions me aside. If you want to ask me, or I'm sure AJ, any questions, um, just like ask me on, on Twitter, Instagram. I'm always there. there always you go. online, yeah. yeah. And, my, my, and my website has little contact me uh, thing, so you can email me because I'm old. I still read emails, uh, but Twitter is fine too. Well, thank you. First thank of all, you so much. I, I, yeah, I wrote a book about gratitude and I forgot to thank, for, I thank you, Dana. I'm a huge fan. I am so honored that you like my work. That is just awesome. And, uh, and Spencer, I also, I loved reading your pieces. The one about, um, uh, who was it? It was applying to a, uh, applying to like a content. Oh, a Tintin. Yeah. Tintin. Thank yeah, you. That was awesome. And thank you. thank you to the Brown University Club and uh, and to Hillel. All right, you guys. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Thank Thanks you, everyone, for, for your time. Guys. And this was amazing. And we look forward to the next one. And the next one, hopefully, will be live. So thank AJ, you all very much. Congratulations. Sometime. Uh, definitely. I love that idea. All right. It's a date. All right. Take care, you guys. Have a great night. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye.